Welcome to Smart Route, the podcast by Call Tracking Metrics, where you'll hear stories from businesses at the intersection of marketing, customer experience, and sales. We're sitting down with business leaders and industry experts to dive deep into the path they took to find success. Here's your host, Courtney Tyson. Hello, everyone, and thanks for listening in. This is actually our 10th episode of Smart Route, which we find very exciting. Slowly but surely, we're getting very good at this. Um, Today, we actually have two special guests with us to discuss building a brand from both the B2C and B2B perspective. Um, Please welcome Wendy Rabin of Rabin Boutique, located in Annapolis, Maryland. Thanks for being here, Wendy. I'm delighted. Thanks for having me. Congratulations on your 10th episode. Thank you. We appreciate that. Um, we're, we're very excited to have you on board today. I'm going to share a little bit more about you with our listeners. Um, so Wendy has uh, 20 years of proven success in the fashion industry. She began her career in marketing and corporate communications, but quickly found herself advising female leadership on personal style. So she built a successful boutique called Sitting Pretty. She then sold that boutique and then served as the marketing director for an American accessory designer. And then in 2013, Wendy founded Raven, a retail concept that seeks to build sustainable wardrobes for clients that transcend time and trend. And uh, being an Annapolis local myself, I can certainly say that today Raven is a staple in the Annapolis shopping scene. Did I uh, leave anything out, Wendy? I'm I'm just, it's really embarrassing to hear something, right, you know, you know, to tell your like your history in like, you know, 30 seconds flat. But thank you. That was a very kind introduction. Wonderful. And thank you for the compliment of Raven. I appreciate it. Of course. Well, thanks for being here again. I appreciate your time. Um, and we also have one of CTM's very own with us as a guest today, Erica Rollins. Thank you for being here, Erica. Hello. Hello. Thrilled to be here alongside the lovely Wendy Raven today. And also hard to believe that we are already on our 10th episode of the Smart Route podcast. So amazing work, everybody from Call Tracking Metrics. Right on. Yeah, so Erica has served as the marketing director at Call Tracking Metrics for over five years, and she spent her career has spent her career helping B2B companies build their brands from both the internal and agency perspective. Um, so Wendy and Erica, you two actually already know each other, both as friends and as two women in the branding world. Uh, tell us a little bit more about how you two have become connected. I think it's really more of a stalking relationship, and I'm going to have to tell you that's the honest to God truth. <laughs> I had, you know, we at Raven, we like to joke that there's like, you know, fashion sparkle dust. And Erica is a byproduct of one of those moments. I was having a an adult tantrum is what I like to say. And I had come down the stairs just to kind of clear my head and have some fun on the showroom floor. And one of our mutual friends happened to be in the store at that time. And she asked, why is your hair on fire right now? And I was lamenting about, you know, just my marketing challenges. You know, I had no one to really noodle with me. I had just lost one of my partners in that way um, to a brighter pasture. And she said that, oh, I have just the person for you. And uh, she introduced me to Erica. I bought Erica dinner and picked her brain and I bought her coffee and I picked her brain more. And um, I luckily have found a friendship with her as well, but just an incredibly generous soul and obviously whip smart in her career. Uh, Yeah, I mean, definitely. I I talk of our friendship, the beginning of our friendship to our mutual friend. Um, And really, you know, once I got over my fear of being fashionably inadequate around Wendy, (laughs) Um, then we just started connecting and bonding to her point over like great food, cocktails, and, you know, most evenings trying to solve the world's problems. So it's been a great relationship. One that I value very, very much. Likewise. Likewise. Well, that's a very sweet story. I love that there are both, you know, personal and professional advantages to your friendship. So that's, that's really great. Um, so Wendy, tell us a little bit more about your background in fashion and how Raven came to be. Sure. Uh, I like to joke that my fashion career started in the 70s because I was constantly dragging my Barbies up and down the street, putting on fashion shows with my friends. Um, but, you know, it's funny. I've, I've, I've always loved this. I didn't, you know, before I knew it was fashion, I just loved clothes. I loved styling. I liked beautiful things. I loved art from a very early age. And it never really occurred to me that it was a path that I could choose for my career. Just, I grew up in a traditional household and you went to business school, you went to law school, you went to medical school and, you know, anything else you might like to do is in your spare time. So, you know, I went the traditional route to college and when I graduated, I 
in the roaring 90s, I, you know, worked with a consulting firm and, you know, traveled the country and learning, honestly, what it took to build a business because I was working with other, you know, larger business owners. Um, and then I uh, was, you know, it was, and it was Marcom. It was, you know, it was, it was external communications for the most part. And I um, found myself moving from D.C. to Annapolis. And at the time I was, um, I ran my own consulting firm. And I was working for the World Bank and I was driving back and forth and back and forth. And I was thinking, there's got to be something better, right? You know, and I've always been a shopper, right? I spent, you know, most people put 20% towards their future. I put all of it towards my closet. Mm -hmm. And um, so when I moved to Annapolis, I, I had nowhere to shop. I absolutely had nowhere to shop. And, you know, in the way that I was looking to dress myself in, you know, age appropriate, career focused young woman. And so, uh, late night driving home uh, after a client meeting, which, you know, I loved my job, honestly, at the time, um, I said, you know, I should just open a store. And it was like one of those like crazy droplet moments that you don't know why happened. And I literally got to work that weekend on a business plan. And less than a year later, I opened Sitting Pretty, which was uh, my first project. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and I figured it out. You know, I learned how to buy. I learned how to go to New York and make introductions. Um, I learned how to put a store together, and I really learned the trade of of fashion retail. Um, and I came to discover that it was my true calling. Um, I fell into it very naturally. It wasn't a huge learning curve outside of the obvious starting a business space. Um, but you know, in a strange way, you know, coming to fashion in the roundabout way that I did, it was really great to have the the business background because that ensured that, you know, putting together the business plan and making sure that there were like, you know, success metrics, you know, baked into the, the progress of, of the business was um, integral. So that was a project that I loved. And I sold it to my partner after about four years. And I went independent and doing marketing consulting. Um, and this is like, you know, back in the early, you know, 2000s, where it was still all print media, you know, Saks Fifth Avenue barely had a website. Um, you know, we literally sent out snail mail cards, and we did print ads. I mean, it was like, it was old school. And so, um, you know, I was helping other local businesses do that. And that's when I jumped over to the accessory brand. Um, I started out as a, you know, marketing assist for them. And then I ended up taking over um, their marketing department and helping reposition them and rebrand them. And um, I loved it. And I thought that was going to be the job that I had for the rest of my life. And then I decided, you know, my husband, and I decided to have a baby. And, you know, babies ruin everything. So I <laughs> realized that I actually wanted to be a mom for a minute and I didn't want to work straight away. And so I took a little bit of a break. And, you know, after a little bit of it, probably a year or two, I was starting to get the itch again. You know, I wasn't feeling creative. I wasn't really actively working with, with fashion or clients in a, in a formal way. And so I started to get back to styling and consulting and I realized that my mom wardrobe was woefully out of touch with what I should have been wearing. And, you know, my old, you know, clothes didn't quite fit. And so I went to work on putting together my professional wardrobe and I had a hard time doing it. Um, and I had a hard time dressing myself. And I realized, you know, after probably two months of, of pulling together my wardrobe again, um, post baby, uh, that it was really hard. And I think other women are finding the same challenges. You know, there's life changes, there's health changes, there's, you know, world changes, there's body changes, there's personality changes, there's, you know, there's all types of things that women go through at a certain age, or maybe not at a certain age. Um, and I found that post baby, mid 30s, no one was speaking to me in the fashion world. And I was feeling quite ignored. And with someone who had pretty legit street credibility in the fashion world, that I was finding it hard to dress myself and find my personal identity in the world of, of clothing was, was frustrating. So from there, Raven was born and um, eight years later, we're still doing, still doing the same thing. I love that. Your, your career evolution is just so interesting, but I just love that your brand speaks to, you know, I think all women, right. Professionally as well. And I think that as women, we're always looking for resources to make ourselves better, especially in, in how we dress because, how we dress really is our brand, right? It's how, how people see us. So, well, absolutely. I mean, and there's studies like, you know, in 2012, uh, this is very, like, very reporting. So you don't have to, like, put my, like, data mark in there. But, <laughs> you know, there's, there's, there's studies based on the fact that, you know, you are empowered by what you wear. It's called enclosed cognition. And, you know, mm -hmm. any woman, I think any person for that matter, but we are 
much more female focused. Any woman will tell you that if she doesn't like what she's wearing that day, her day is not as good as it could be. I don't care if you had the best business meeting. I don't care if you had the best pitch meeting. I don't care if you were the best mom that day. But if you didn't like what you were wearing, there's a there is a level of happiness you will not achieve. <laughs> it's like it is little. It's documented, yeah, it's you know, so like in, yeah. in data, <laughs> you know. And I think that's mm-hmm. what you know. I I realized, you know, when you're younger, things fit differently, and you're just the devil may care. But you know, as you get older and you care more specifically about how you present yourself, you you're really more thoughtful about your personal brand. Um, mm-hmm. That's when you really need everything to be firing on all pistons. And you know, we at Raven, we really try and take that daily dressing stress off of your plate, knowing that when you walk out feeling like yourself, looking like yourself, that's when you're going to slay the dragon. Sure. And I can relate to that so much because, you know, I'm a, I'm a, a mom in my, you know, thirties to a two year old and still kind of working through my career and trying to do the best I can every day. And if I, you know, look good, then I feel good. So I can absolutely right. relate to that. I love that. Yeah, right on. Um, so Erica, Let's move to you and hear a little bit more about you. Um, tell us about your you and you know your role at Call Tracking Metrics. Sure. Yeah. So I actually began my career as a graphic designer. So similar to to Wendy, um, I think we're both creatives at heart. And you know, really, I like to say that I've you know over the years combined the best of both worlds, which is you know the ability to think creatively while still kind of fueling my passion for tactical and detailed marketing execution. We call it like the Virgo curse. Um, and so that combination has really served me well here, in particular, call tracking metrics over the years and and certainly at other, you know, in my past lifetimes as well, you know, working for agencies, other technology startup companies, um, working for the Savannah College of Art and Design, you name it, right? But that blend, you know, really has helped me, particularly at call tracking metrics, because our company and our brand has evolved so much over these last, you know, five, six years. Um, and so when I started at call tracking metrics, in the early years, I spent most of my time building the creative side of the brand from style guides, messaging, digital experiences, just really trying to get a, you know, build this, this kind of brand, right. And give it a look and feel and a personality over time, that role has shifted to more of the brand strategy for both, you know, lead generation, customer acquisition, and then also customer retention. Um, and so, Really, that starts with bringing on the right talent. So a big focus has been growing the team. Um, Today, I'm really proud to say that we have an amazing team, and I'm just so honored to work with each and every one of them. Um, And so our team is also more focused now on go-to-market planning. That really helps define our product vision and then also drives cross-functional collaboration within the company. And that's just a really important part of our culture here at Call Tracking Metrics. I can certainly attest that you have a wonderful team and you guys do a wonderful job of telling our story. Um, So this next question is, is for Wendy, Um, you know, whether a business is B2B or or B2C, you know, online conversions are obviously top of mind. Um, E-commerce and flexible buying and checkout retailer for retailers have, has boomed and is, you know, will likely continue to boom into the holiday season. Um, so Wendy, over the past 18 months, how has Raven adapted to these shifts in consumer behaviors? And how has having a physical store and e-commerce options worked or not worked in your favor during this time? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, I think anyone, certainly, especially brick and mortar, right? That's I can always speak from that perspective because that's who we are. Um, you know, anyone during the land of COVID, as I like to call it, had to dig into what their tools were, right? You know, thankfully going into this, we we did have an e-com site. We did have an Instagram, uh, what is it, Instagram account <laughs> presence, I should say. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, you know, had Facebook and that was pretty much all she wrote. Um, we, you know, we had a newsletter campaign that we were actively sending to our clients digitally, but, you know, all of those media were very much in the kind of embryonic, it's nice to have, it's up there, it looks good, it's on brand, but it was really just a, a tool for our brick and mortar clients to to make sure that we had some touch point front of mind opportunities to bring them into the store, right? To remind them that we were there. In the land of COVID, um, you know, we didn't have that ability to just see them all the time, to engage with them, to run into the grocery store, to see them walking down the street, you know, to catch them after their lunch at Flamont. So we had to find new ways to to find wallet share with them, right? Um, I think that having the e-com was certainly integral. And what we found very quickly is that we had to dial into that. Um, we 
rushed to get inventory integrity. We rushed to have an ease of checkout. We were lucky that our partner Shopify, um, our e-com and point of sale partner Shopify, you know, they added, you know, curbside pickup. They added local delivery for button checkouts. Do you know what I mean? Like all of those ways that you can make it easy to to cash and carry, whatever that looks like in the land of COVID. Um, so having so leaning into the tools and making them work for us was was highly important. Um, marrying that with brick and mortar is where well, there's the rub, right? Um, you know, how do you replicate brick and mortar in the digital world? Um, and that's a challenge that we're still working on, frankly. Um, but I think that certainly we learned so much during the land of COVID to in in you know what tools worked. What tools didn't work as much? Where were where are the redundancies? Where are their efficiencies? Um, and so leaning into those tools and making sure that we are using them in the right way to communicate with our client in the right with the right messaging um, was 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 so important. Um, so I think anyone who has the brick and mortar experience and is looking into you know ecom has to be thoughtful about who they are and what they're really trying to say. Um, and, you know, just putting up a splashy, you know, e-com doesn't make sense if that's not who you are. So I think really trying to find ways to replicate your in-store experience online is one of the best ways to use those digital tools and, and make it easy, make it pretty, um, you know, but make sure that they have that your client as having a similar experience online as they are in your store. Gotcha. Did that, so, did that answer your question? Oh, absolutely. So what you're saying is marrying, <laughs> marrying digital channels with, with, with brick and with your brick and mortar presence is super important, but you have to do it in the best way that suits your brand and best kind of tells your story. Sure. I think so. And again, you know, at Raven, that's one of the biggest challenges we have right now. That's the heavy lift of kind of excavating who we are and how to replicate our experience and, and in, in digital, in different markets, even outside of Annapolis. Um, but, you know, one of the things that Erica in our first conversation said to me was, mm -hmm. you know, what are you trying to say to your client? Like who, who, what does she want from you? And that seed of, um, you know, advice is really one of the things that drives how I approach um, our, our marketing digitally now. You know, what, what am I trying to say to her? I don't need to put it out there. It's already a noisy space, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think it really, really is important to, you know, figure out who you are, figure out what you're trying to say to her. In my case, it's a her. Um, and make sure that it's authentic to your brand. And I think sometimes that gets lost in the rush to put something online. You know, don't just put it online, make it meaningful. Sure. I love that. That makes tons of sense. Thank you, Wendy. Mm -hmm. um, and so Erica, from the B2B perspective, what are some of the ways marketers can make the most of this e-commerce driven holiday season? Yeah. So kind of building on what Wendy was talking about, right. And you're trying to recreate this digital experience for buyers, um, you know, that replicates the same feeling that they get in store um, or brick and mortar. So, you know, a lot of the tools, you know, there's several things that, that, you know, brands can start to, to incorporate in their marketing, you know, contextual targeting is a big one um, to help target online shoppers based on the content that they're consuming today, right. Rather than just looking at past user behavior, because those rules may not apply anymore. You know, we've seen a lot of changes over the, you know, the last year, year and a half. Um, and so contextual targeting is really going to help capitalize on those opportunities that are happening right now. Um, also rethink your creative. Everybody says, you know, static ads don't work anymore. Interactive ads, you know, if you, especially if you're thinking about retail, if you're having sales, special events, you could, you know, incorporate countdowns to those events or um, shoppable video and clickable links. So, if, you know, again, adding those, sales and events to your personal calendar, for example, with one click, right? Those are just kind of nice tools that you can leverage to make it very easy for, for consumers. Um, also thinking about discovery ads to boost awareness, engage buyer interest in any kind of particular topics or products, and then finding creative ways to get consumers to volunteer information to build a more personalized buyer experience, which is really going to become more important as we step away from third-party cookies and we're looking for that first-party data. And, you know, I think at the end of the day, consumers just expect convenience, right? It's not, it's not an added benefit. That's what they expect from brands. And so we need to deliver on that and, and really meet consumers where they are. So try a variety of things, contextual targeting, rethinking creative discovery, discovery ads. And mm -hmm. I think too, what, what kind of speaks to, to what we've been talking about is brands really need to speak to their customers in the way they want to be spoken to. And what I mean by that mm -hmm. is you know, the different channels that we all communicate with brands exactly. through. So yeah, that's interesting. Yep, as well. Exactly. So um, a question for both of you. So whoever wants to answer by all means, 
uh, speak on up. <laughs> I've been hearing a lot about uh, human human marketing in 2021. Uh, could you tell me a little bit more about this approach and how brands should be thinking about this in the new year? Yeah, you know, so really human to human marketing today is just simply a conversational way of communicating with other brands and clients. And, you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, we're all selling to a person, even in B2B, right? And so advancements in technology have certainly made human to human marketing a more realistic um, and also affordable option for brands. And, you know, so consider tapping it you know, influencers for store openings or social events, um, using ambassadors as billboards and, and doing what Wendy does so well. Um, and I know you can certainly add some value here, Wendy, but using your brand's greatest assets, which is your people in your own campaigns, like featuring your employees and your advertising and sort of developing that deeper emotional connection with your loyal customers and buyers by sharing their stories and finding ways to also incorporate your local community and bring your brand together with them to better serve your customers. So I know, Wendy, you do a lot of these things really well. Obviously, your team members are in your Instagram ads and they're, you know, you've got them doing the content, um, which is so great, but also you partner with local businesses in our area, you know, to put on events, um, you know, that the whole community can benefit from. Um, that's a very generous compliment. Thank you, Erica. I appreciate it. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, human to human, I mean, I'm like, you know, my marketing background is from like 1923. So, you know, bear with me for a minute, but you know, <laughs> You know, human to human is just, it's relationship marketing. I'm sure there's 800 mm -hmm. other words in there, um, you know, from, you know, marketing one-on-one -on -one books dating back to when I was in school. And honestly, I don't know any other way, right? I, I really think that this sort of new buzzword of human to human marketing is a, it, it's a repositioning, repackaging from, you know, these bigger box, large e-commerce spaces who have thrown on the emergency brake in the land of COVID and we're like, Blah, we can't do it this way anymore, you know? And I think there's a silver lining here and I'll get to why small business is really what's going to solve the world's problems. Um, just bear with me for my thread. But, you know, I, I think that this, you know, this big emergency break moment from the bigger box department stores, large e-commerce sites, they were so prescriptive in their approach. And there was, I mean, it wasn't, it was, it was robots. It was, you know, AI, it was all of the things that have depersonalized the shopping experience for the consumer. I mean, this is industry agnostic, right? This is not just fashion and retail. So, you know, you have this crazy prescriptive approach where, you know, in my industry, let's say, you know, a big department store, it's like we bought 75 units, 35,000 units of this particular garment. So therefore, this is what's hot for the season. And they're shoving it down the consumer's throats. Oh, and we have 50,000 units of this particular garment. Yeah, this is gonna be hot too. <laughs> well, we've got a lot <laughs> left over, you know, to the point where they were getting so far ahead of the fashion season that, you know, they're now dictating what the designers do. And I think the COVID, the land of COVID really turned the telescope on them to say, you know, that consumers who were kind of just digesting this like, you know, white bread, vanilla, marketing prescription glossy ad you know moment were woke up and said you know what this kind of blind consumerism is not it's not for me not interested thanks pass and i think that's where you saw a lot of these bigger companies either start to crumble in some cases you know bye bye barney's bye bye nordstrom you know um but you also saw bigger cracks in those institutions that have survived um, and so this human to human marketing, it's not new. I mean, at all. I mean, you go back in the fifties where you had accounts and hi, Mrs. Smith, you got it. I'll bring the bread over later. We're just finishing baking it, you know, send Susie by. That's what it is. It's talking to your consumer and uh, relating to her instead of saying, this is what's hot for the season. It's like, what do you want to buy? What mm -hmm. do you need? Did you just have a baby? Maybe you feel a little bloated today. How about let's dress you? let's give you what you're asking for. Let's talk to you like a human being, not like a robot. And let's talk to you as an individual. And I think that those of us in the brick and mortar space or, or small business for that matter, doesn't have to be brick and mortar. You know, those of us who have survived the land of COVID, who leaned into our DNA, who leaned into our relationships, um, realize the value in that. And so that's really reassuring because you have this, again, this turning of the telescope moment where it's like, you know what? This is working. It is good that I know that my client just had a baby. It is good to know that my client has survived breast cancer. It is good to know that her son just got married and to participate in those life events, good, bad, somewhere in the middle, right? You know, we're giving her 
space to find who she is as a human through clothing, through accessories, through things that make you feel all good and squishy, right? You know, it's called retail therapy for a reason. And I think this, you know, this new concept, air quotes here, of human to human marketing is just a repositioning of what we should have been doing all along. And those of us who have done it all along are really feeling the the swell of, of support from not just our existing clients, but new clients, because they're looking for some authenticity. You know, they're looking for that relationship. They're looking for a reason to buy because we all love to spend money. Right. We all we and it, maybe it's clothing for you. Maybe it's art for you. Maybe it's shoes. Maybe it's plants. Maybe it's art. You know, maybe it's drills. Not for me. Thank you very much. But, you know, whatever it is that you're looking for, you want it to be meaningful and you want it to have an experience behind it. And I think that's really what you're talking about when you're asking about human to human marketing. Um, so I think that it's important to lean into that. And, you know, again, you know, like I said earlier in our conversation, you know, I'm in the process of excavating my brand and really digging into who we are at our core, because I'm really excited to, to give my client who can't come to Annapolis, for example, I want to give her the Raven experience, right? But what does that look like? And, mm -hmm. you know, my website now it's, it's nice, it's pretty, it's pretty easy to navigate, you know, it's very plug and play. So anyone who's out there who is a brick and mortar, please get online. It's very easy to do. Um, but like that, you know, the next click up is how do we give her the experience online so that she feels like she's hanging out with us? That's, yeah. that's, that's, hard to solve that that's for me. the Raven experience too. You, <laughs> that, I mean, you really, and that's what it's about. You make buyers feel special. And that's the key. And I think you, you know, you said it human to human marketing. We just, you know, buyers, we, I include myself in that. We just want to feel special and walking into Raven is an experience and that is difficult in some ways to replicate online. But yeah. I know that that's something that you were dedicating a lot of time and resources into figuring out, right. How to solve that problem and how to do it. Um, yeah. And, and so dinner, you and I next week, that. right, Erica? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm <laughs> to dig a little bit. No, but I mean, I mean, to piggy, to, to further echo, you know, what you just said, Erica, I mean, people want, you know, a reason to buy, but like, we should be, we should be grateful for this. Like anyone who's selling, who's, who's you know, any peddler out there, you know, at the core, anyone who sells something, we're peddlers, right? Like we should be very grateful that these people are taking time, taking their money to invest in the business that we want to have. I mean, I think that there's an opportunity for, for retailers in general to, to really express their gratitude for people who are finding them, who are coming in the door or in the, you know, in, in, in into the homepage. Um, and I think that there's a real opportunity for people to, to say thank you, you know, for those consumers mm -hmm. who continue to, 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 to shop, frankly. I love this. And I just love your passion, Wendy, as well. Um, <laughs> I, you know, like you said, it's all about building that deeper emotional connection. And Erica, like you said, you know, making the buyer feel special. Yeah. I definitely want to feel special when I you know, yeah. purchase something from somewhere. Right. Um, and, and, and speaking of making or building that that deeper connection, let's talk a little bit about social media. So they say consumers who connect with brands and social networks, they are more loyal customers of nine out of 10 buying from companies that they follow. So what advice do you have for small or emerging brands and how to best leverage social media to connect with buyers online? And so, Wendy, let's hear from you and then let's hear from Erica. Oh, darn it. I was just, just going to replicate whatever she said. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you know, kidding aside, you know, it, it's crazy. When I first got into fashion retail, like I said, it was, I mean, even the big boxes barely had internet, right? Or uh, websites, so to speak. Um so this whole new media that, by the way, is free, is one of the best, most powerful tools out there. You know, I mean, I know from my experience, especially prior to and certainly in the middle of the land of COVID. And now as we find our new normal, mm -hmm. you know, in the land of, you know, COVID, you know, 2.0, you know, we really have this opportunity, this platform to communicate with our client. I mean, it is very, it feels very engaging. You know, they always say, you know, that, you know, morning shows on the TV, it's like, oh, you welcome us into your room every day. You know, we get welcomed into people's lives on a daily basis. You know, I, I struggle with getting my face online, but my team has been so generous and 
thoughtful about stepping into the role of being our ambassadors and being the face of our business. Um, you know, they're doing the modeling for us. They're, they're engaging daily with our clients and stories and on the grid. Um, and that moves the needle more than anything else in the entire planet for us. I mean, unless you are physically in the store and we're engaging with you personally, the opportunity for us to play dress up with you digitally happens on Instagram. For us, it's Instagram and we push to Facebook, but that is one of the most important tools that any retailer can have because you are literally, I mean, it is, it is free, it is accessible, it is so easy to operate. And even apps in a strategy, all you have to do is show up because they're there watching. It's a captive audience, you know? Sure. Yeah. Yeah consistency, right? Uh, timing, consistency, just making sure like if you're just getting started. And I read something recently about treating your social media networks as like a virtual cocktail party and connecting with followers mm. in a more casual manner, in, excuse me, in a more casual manner. But this is another thing, you know, Wendy, that your team does really well, right? And you've been very successful with. And we have joked that the content on your social that most of your followers engage with, it's it's the personal content. You know, yes, totally. everybody loves to see those, you know, click to shop ads and you know, featuring new things, but they're it's your team. They recognize your team. You know, they see that, you know, they've got, you know, the actual store team members that are there in these clothes and they recognize them. They recognize their faces. So they feel like they're part of it. And yet they also want to see Wendy at the beach with her family <laughs> and you know, these types of things. Like, but when we joke about it, but it's true, it's the personal connections that you're making with these consumers. And that can happen very organically over social media. Um, and so it should be looked at as a significant growth channel for, for businesses, you know, especially small businesses. Um, and it's typically lower cost than a lot of other paid media channels. So I think to your point, companies really need to make it a priority and stay active and, you know, just initially come up with a plan, assign responsible parties to manage the posts and, you know, keep your profile up to date and, you know, kind of build it out from there. I love yeah, that. Just, um, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I mean, Erica makes so many good points, right? That, you know, that especially with strategy, you can, without a doubt, make this such an impactful, you know, uh, space on your bottom line with, 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 which way less investment than there ever used to be. Obviously there's paid media and that's important to make sure that you have a strategy behind that. But I just think that the, the consistency and the value of being a part of, of that channel is so, so meaningful for, for small and large brands. It's crazy how, the, just the organic reach will, will, will find you. It's, it's yeah, just crazy. Yeah. And it seems to be an afterthought still for a lot of brands. And so oh my if, God, totally. if there's anything <laughs> that will say is you can build an entire brand, you can launch an entire brand on social media alone. So don't, don't make it an afterthought, right? Make it a priority channel. Oh, that's sure. a great way of saying it. Yeah. And I absolutely love that your employees are your models as well, because I think as a consumer, when we're buying something, especially clothing, I mean, we want to see that piece of clothing on a real person, not on a, on a, on a model and on an, on an edited ad, right? So I think that makes it so much real, so much more real as well. Um, and I think Erica, when it comes to, to B2C using, you know, social media too, to share those case studies, share those those real customer stories. That's how your brands are really best connecting with their, their customers and their prospects too. Exactly. Yep. You can't ignore that peer-to-peer -peer selling you know, that's, that's huge, right? Especially sure. when you need to be. Mm -hmm. So Wendy, what does the future growth look like for Raven? Yeah, I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'll tell you after dinner next week with Erica. Um, no, it's so funny because we, you know, we're, it's such an odd time that we're still existing in, right? Like there was like pre-COVID and after COVID and immediately prior to um, COVID shutting down the world, we, I had realized that we had exercised, you know, my business plan. Like, I mean, everything had been checked and I was feeling rudderless mm -hmm. because frankly, I didn't have a plan in place. So I was working on the next, you know, five, 10 year out plan. And, you know, and then when COVID hit, it went straight from, you know, dreaming and planning to holding on for dear life. And, you know, you marry sort of planning and dreaming with holding on for dear life and the lessons, you know, we've taken from that. Um, it's put us, put, put me in a completely different growth mindset, which I'm grateful for. Um, you know, we have a lot of products coming out that are going to be more 
accessible virtually. You know, there's virtual styling. We're going to be kicking off Raven Wardrobing, which is a subscription type of service. Um, we're working hard to um, ensure that our clients can engage with our stylists um, in a more meaningful virtual way so that we have opportunities to grow into other markets. We're looking to make, to, to develop, we're, I'm in the process of developing our digital platform so that it does start to really replicate what we offer that high touch, highly personal, highly engaged environment in our store online so that the people who are looking for, you know, that wardrobe advice and the wardrobe building in the way that we provide it, you know, um, and that we can get to them and it, and it, we can invite them into our world no matter where they are. So lots of fun things on the horizon, lots of work to do. Um, but it's exciting. So, and especially using the tools available to us now, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a brave new world and it's, it's pretty cool to think about. Very exciting stuff. I'm excited to follow along too. See how things go. Um, so I have to ask too, um, and you know, when we were, when we were kind of preparing for this interview with the both of you, um, the one thing I wanted to ask was, you know, being that you two are very good friends and you've mentored each other, I, I'm interested to know. What is one thing that you've each learned from one another? Ooh, one I thing? Can go. One thing that stands <laughs> out. Sure. I, or multiple right, things. Let me, let, me, let me go get Yeah, you got, list. sure. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think I mentioned it earlier in the conversation. I mean, I one of the things that really echoes in my head is truly, you know, what are you trying to say, Wendy? What does she want to hear from you? And I think that that's such an easy, you know, throwaway comment to some level, but it was just so poignant and meaningful. And every time I come back to, you know, thinking about strategy or thinking about a new, um, you know, launch, you know, that seed of what are you trying to say has been so valuable and really has like echoed. Um, and it's it, it made me more deliberate and more thoughtful. Um, so I'm super grateful for that. And then also in general, it just, you know, the idea that there's, there's nothing you can't do, right? I mean, Erica is very, has been very supportive and very encouraging. And, you know, she believes in my point of view and she has been so supportive of, um, you know, what that could possibly be. And I've, and anytime I've called her in a fit of, you know, hair on fire, you know, what do you think about this? And she's like, this is how you saw it. Let me help you with this. Let's, let's talk about it. Let's dialogue through it. And I just, I love that she is always a hundred percent on my team and that kind of support and that kind of um, lesson of like, Hey, let's solve it. Let's do it. You can totally do this. It's just, it's huge. Um, so I'm sure there's so many more, but those are front of mind for me right now. I'm 100% team Wendy, uh, always, no. all, all in. Um, but I mean, listen, you know, everybody who's heard you speak today can understand why, you know, I am so inspired by you every day. You know, and anytime I think that I'm busy, I remember back, you know, over this last year when we've been spending time together and it's like, you are, honestly, you're a hustler. You launched a successful retail brand, somehow managed a major house renovation project, balanced your family, and still had, dare I say, a very active social life. So, um, you know, but seriously, you have taught me so much about the importance of, you know, being vulnerable in business, because at the end of the day, we're all human, right? And then also to trust your instincts and not take any BS from anyone along the way. And I just, I love you for that. So thank you. Home girl, right back at you. <laughs> I love how much you guys value one another. You're, you're, you're very lucky to have the friendship that you do. Totally. I agree. And so um, before we say goodbye, is there anything either of you would like to plug? Raven.com. <laughs> Agree? Yes. yes. And follow them on social. Follow yeah. them on social. Yeah. Definitely. That's W-R-A-B-Y-N. -W That's yes. right. Yeah. Yes. Same thought yes. process here. I love that. I love that. <laughs> Like wrapping paper. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're ever in, you know, the DC Baltimore region, please be sure to visit Wendy and her team at the boutique in beautiful downtown Annapolis to really, really have that, that Raven experience in person. That'd be wonderful. Yeah. So I would also just like to share with our listeners that there's never been a better time to check out our call tracking metrics, marketing attribution and conversation intelligence platform, because if you sign up before December 31st, you'll get two months free. So it's a great way to try out the platform. Well, thank you both for being our guests. I think what we've discussed here you know, today will certainly help our listeners set themselves up for success, whether it be they're trying to figure out how to tie their, their you know, online presence and brand to their brick and mortar 
um, store, whether it be they're trying to set themselves up for the holiday season or just generally strategizing. This is just a, a really great conversation. And just the fact that you two are such great friends and mentors to one another has really added, I think, a little something special to extra special to this episode. So thank you again for your time, Wendy and Erica. Thank you. It's a lot of thank fun. You. Appreciate it. Yeah, of course. And thank you to our listeners as well for following along. We appreciate it. Um, keep up with us on our website and on Twitter at SmartRoutePod. We'll talk to you soon.